Hello and welcome once again to episode 25 of Code Completion. We are a group of iOS developers and educators hoping to share what we love most about development, Apple technology, and completing your code. My name is Dimitri and I'll be your host once again for this episode and I'm joined today by my fellow completionists, Spencer. Hey there. And Ben. Hey, hey. So uh, before we get into our main topic, uh, it's time for our indie app spotlight. Spencer, can you take it away? Okay, so the first uh, app that we have is called Bound. Um, it's an audiobook player. Uh, and it's uh, so just going off of the description here, it says uh, listen to your favorite uh, DRM free audiobooks with Bound. So you can import a bunch of uh, different file types like MP3s, M4As, AACs. Um, something that's really cool too is that there is a bunch of integration with. Uh, getting those files into the app itself. So they've got Dropbox, Google Drive, um, OneDrive, the Files app, of course. Um, you can airdrop as well. Um, and there are a couple really cool features, like um, it'll remember you know, the place that you were at in the audio file, so you can jump back into you know, your audiobook or whatever you're listening to. Um, and, you know, stuff that is, uh, maybe perhaps a little less important, but people still like it. Things like, you know, your theme, uh, it's got series shortcuts, uh, CarPlay, if you're listening to it in the car. So some really cool features. It's got a bunch of reviews. It's got like a 4.5, uh, average rating. Um, so go ahead and check that out. I think that'll be a really cool book or app. If you listen to a bunch of audiobooks. Okay, so our next app is called Money Coach. Um, it's there are a couple uh, Money Coach apps that I saw on the App Store. So this one is uh, Money Coach Budget and Spendings. Um, it's probably going to be the one that comes up first um, by Perjan uh, Duro. Sorry if I'm saying that wrong. Um, this is a kind of a, a really cool app with a bunch of features that you know. I think you might like if you know you you're trying to just be like okay well what is my budget for this thing or whatever at a glance it's got a bunch of wi widgets it says it's got more than eight widgets which is pretty cool um, you can import your statements from your Apple card uh, with a single tap you can uh, import from like a CSV or something if you've got uh, those as well it's got a Mac app which is awesome um, bunch of different things for just budgeting um, security things like touch ID and face ID so uh, everything's uh, secure and safe uh, with all of this financial information and everything and it's got a, um, a a premium subscription if you want it I, uh, I I don't have it so I I don't know exactly what it's got oh let's see I just found it okay so uh, sync your data between every device a bunch of different goals you can have unlimited budgets and accounts um, add photos of your receipts and all that stuff uh, and, and a ton more than that. So this is really cool. I'm I'm going to try. I just downloaded it to do it for the spotlight, but um, I'm actually going to give this a shot and, and take a look and kind of, uh, you know, see how it works. So, all right. And the last app we have is called Attendance 2 by Dave Reed. Um, this is an attendance taking app. So like if you're a teacher or something, um, I, I was looking through this and I was just like, man, this would have been uh, helpful at times uh, when I was uh, teaching at boot camps. Uh, sometimes we did take attendance for various reasons. Um, and it was always a pain to, you know, have to bring out my notes app or, or whatever just to do this. It's got it so you can set it up with uh, students, you can add photos and everything, you can add custom statuses so it's not like present or absent are the only ones, but you could do, uh, I don't know, showed up late or something. Um, so that's really cool. Um, I personally don't have a use for this app now. However, I definitely would have probably used this even six months ago or so. Um, so it's got a, um, it's apparently a, a rewrite of the original attendance app. That's why it's called it attendance too. So um, it's got a bunch of new features. And if you're kind of, you know, in the, if you ever need to take attendance, I feel like this would be a really helpful app. So uh, give it, give it a look and check it out. Are you an developer? We want to hear from you. Our list is long at the moment, but please reach out to us on Twitter at code completion. So we can spotlight your app as well. So our main topic for this week is all about Objective-C and if it's still relevant for new developers uh, to really start learning. Um, so as you may know, 
or as you may not know, um, Apple's main frameworks uh, were all written in Objective-C. And up until a few years ago, if you wanted to write an iOS app or a Mac app, you would need to write that app in Objective-C. Now, a lot of uh, other developers that were not used to Apple's platforms may have thought Objective-C looked really weird because it has a very different syntax than most other languages. Uh, and that was actually um, a point of friction that a lot of people didn't really care for uh, in a new language that they suddenly had to learn to uh, join on this platform. Uh, but ever since Apple came out with Swift, we've seen lots and lots of new developers come over uh, to iOS and start making apps with it. Um, and it's gone to that point six or seven years later, right? Uh, Swift came out in 2014, I think. Correct. So it's, it's been quite a while. Um, and it's gone to that point where we're starting to think as new frameworks like Swift UI come out that are not usable from Objective-C, is Objective-C still a relevant language to learn if you're just starting out? And um, like, should you, should you learn it on the go? Should you put effort into learning it for your first job? There's a lot of questions like that that are kind of going around. Uh, so uh, let's start with you, Spencer, since you actually had an Objective-C question uh, that you asked us all in our internal little Slack uh, earlier today. Uh, what do you think about Objective-C and should it be something that people uh, consider as they, as they learn more about development? Yeah, definitely. Um, so let me kind of preface by saying um, I started learning iOS development uh, after Swift had already came out. So uh, Swift is, I guess you could call it my primary language where um, that is what I was taught. I didn't learn Objective-C as sort of a, as my first uh, programming language. Um, uh, nor is it, yeah, well, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Um, so what happened was I, everything was very focused on Swift and I learned uh, what would essentially be an equivalent of maybe, I don't know, eight hours of Objective-C uh, when I went through my own bootcamp to, to learn iOS development. It wasn't much at all. Uh, what happened was I kind of got in there and I realized, holy crap, like Dimitri said, uh, this syntax is super weird, especially coming from Swift, where it's modern and it is very readable. Um, so uh, I, for a while, didn't really touch Objective-C until I started uh, teaching. And at Lambda School, we had a much longer curriculum and we could, you know, teach Objective-C for more than a few hours. Uh, it wasn't a ton, but it was, it was much more. And so I learned Objective-C a little bit more there. Um, and what I would always tell people was, you know, yeah, you're, if you have, uh, if you work at a company where they've been around for more than, you know, six or seven years now at this point, um, and they have an app that's older than that, then it's probably going to be an, at least partially an objective C. Um, so fast forward to today, uh, where I work, LumaTouch is, um, has been around for longer than Swift has been around. Uh, and the app is mostly Objective-C. We're, we're slowly kind of converting over to Swift. Uh, in fact, that was what I was doing for the first few months of my job was taking part of uh, one of our frameworks and sort of converting it over to uh, Swift, modernizing it, um, making it a lot easier for, for everyone to use, um, especially the, the people that didn't originally write it. Uh, so going back to what uh, Dimitri said, uh, I had a question today about, you know, uh, one thing in Objective-C that I just couldn't get to work. Um, and I, w luckily we, you know, have a, a rubber ducky channel where I'm able to rubber duck to everyone and, and vice versa. Um, and it wasn't a big issue, but, you know, there was a lot of o mental overhead that I have in Objective-C because it's not my first language. And so uh, instead of just thinking about the problem, I also have to think about the language. It doesn't come as naturally to me uh, syntactically. Like I remember a few weeks ago, I got frustrated because I would forget to put parentheses in my conditional logic when making an if statement. It's just, you know, I, I'm not used to the syntax. And so it's, it's a bother sometimes. Um, so this is all a long winded way of saying, yes, I think it is important to learn Objective-C. I don't know if you need to make it the um, the focal point of your iOS development. Again, if you're working for maybe a new startup, 
you may never touch it. But uh, with an app like ours that is just monolithic and, and huge, uh, there's, there's going to be Objective-C for a while, uh, I, I would assume, uh, even as we slowly convert over to Swift. Um, ben, I think your company is doing things a little bit different, which is ironic because you're the one that knows Objective-C way more <laughs> than I do. <laughs> uh, you guys are doing everything in Swift UI, is that right? Or just entirely in Swift? Yeah, so our code base is is you know Swift as the language, but we're then we're, for our UI, we're using Swift UI, um, mm-hmm. and uh, it is definitely a pretty big departure from what I've done in the past. I started out uh, in 2010 as an iOS developer, and at the time, all you could learn was Objective C, so that's what I learned on and how I learned how to build iOS apps. And then in 2014, when Swift came out, uh, I actually remember being in the conference room at my at my then job. Uh, watching the keynote because it was important, right, for for the development of what we were doing, um, and they announced, oh yeah, one more thing, we're launching a new language, and I was like, oh crap, I have a whole, <laughs> whole new language to learn. Like, I'm not super excited about this. What happens if they if they you know uh, if they deprecate Victor C really quickly? It's going to be a problem for us. It turns out that it you know it was a much longer process to convert than I was sort of initially fearing, which is good. It gives you time to kind of learn and and adapt. But um, I have since written a whole lot of Swift and, and now am a predominantly a Swift developer. There's a little bit of, of Objective-C in our code base, uh, mostly because the one of the libraries we use actually is, uh, it's an, uh, a first party library that we built um, in C. And so there's, I would guess there's probably a way to bridge directly to Swift, but I didn't want to bother. So uh, I built an Objective-C bridge between that code and Swift so that we could easily talk to it. Um, so there's just a little tiny little bit of objective C in our code, but it's mostly Swift. It's all Swift for the for like the application logic. Um, and then uh, we actually have two apps, uh, one that's out and one that we're building. The one that's out was a uh, is a UI kit app, so it's using Swift and you know all the normal UI kit stuff. Um, and that's because at the time it just definitely didn't seem like Swift UI was ready. Uh, sure. And so then for um, for this new app, we decided to kind of go all in on Swift UI to give it a try, and it kind of kept working and kept working and kept working. And we're like, well, we haven't any major snags. Let's just keep going. Um, and now we have a pretty large uh, application written entirely in Swift UI. There's probably, oh, I don't know, there's probably like 30 something screens uh, that are designed in Swift UI in the app. Um, and there, there are some little weird things here and there, but for the most part, it's working pretty well. Uh, so no major complaints, no 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 major regrets about doing that. There's a few things that are a little inflexible because of just the way that SwiftUI has been built. There's e- there's edge cases that I think they haven't gotten to yet, um, and so you're like, well, why can't I do this, right? It's like, well, you can't. Or if you want to do that, you have to sort of heavily hack into the thing and try and try and make it work. But then at the you know at best, it's going to be a hack. So mm-hmm. uh, that that is that is the downside of being kind of on the bleeding edge of this stuff, right? Whereas if for example, this is an Objective-C application using UIKit stuff. You know, while may while might not be as approachable, it's certainly very rock solid, right? That's that's yeah, the advantage definitely. of using uh, an older language like that. I mean, Objective-C has been around since the '80s, I'm pretty sure, uh, and uh, Apple has been using it for a very long time. It was it was part of the reason why it's there is because next uh, next step, the OS that they bought it turned into Mac OS X was a Objective-C focused uh, OS. And so they kind of, you know, in some ways inherited that. And, and that's become the basis for everything we've done over the last 20 years as Apple developers. Um, so while it may not be new and, and sexy, it is it is old, but very tried and true. And I think that's a thing that people often overlook about Objective-C as a language is that, you know, it's not the new hotness, but it is something that you can get a lot of really heavy work done in, and you know, as long as you're willing to adapt to the sort of funky syntax and stuff, which I still find charming, even even you know, while it's a little bit annoying sometimes, I still find it quite charming to use. Um, and I think that it had a lot of really good ideas that that uh, other languages did not. It came from a Java and like C sharp uh, sort of programming world before I became an iOS dev. I did a couple of years as as a Java, and then. C sharp uh, developer, and you know those are fine languages, but uh, Objective C definitely had more. I feel like it was more opinionated, and therefore, as long as you, <laughs> as long as you liked the opinions, then uh, I felt like it was kind of overall a better language, a more expressive language to use, which I thought was really cool. Um, 
it was not my first programming language, but it was kind of the first one that I used with any real super seriousness where I dug in, you know, quite a bit and, and built full production apps with. Um, and, and it was, uh, for me at the time, it was definitely a breath of fresh air. And then Swift was, Swift was scary uh, and new and then was, <laughs> was super frustrating um, when it was like Swift 1 and 2 and even 3. Um, yeah. And now that we're at Swift 5, uh, and, and you know, we're about to get a new sort of iteration of that this summer. Um, it's definitely coming into its own, and it's definitely at the point where I feel like it's, you know, not fully mature, but it's mature enough that you can be, again, you can get serious work done with the language, and that's what I loved about Objective C, um, and I'm, I'm happy that Swift is now there as well. Uh, but it's, I think, I think I will always have kind of a little bit of a soft spot for Objective C in my heart because it's the it's the first language that I that I really truly felt productive in um, and, and I, that I made, I think for me at the time, I'm sure if I were to look at that code now, it'd be scary. But at the time when I was first learning, you know, iOS, it was, it was really cool to kind of, you know, dig into all of those, those big topics and, and learn all these new interesting things. Uh, and so I'll, I think I'll always kind of appreciate the language for that reason. I mean, what's not to love about winky frowny faces on every line, right? <laughs> right. Um, because that's what you end up with Objective-C. You have your yep. end square bracket and then your semicolon, and it just makes winky frowny faces everywhere. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that, that's something definitely uh, something to look forward to when you write lots of Objective-C code uh, that right. you start to miss uh, when you start writing a lot of Swift code. Yeah. yeah. I mean, as Spencer was mentioning, leaving out like parentheses on if statements and stuff like that, when you're using Objective-C, the compiler is kind of dumb, uh, and it does not yeah. fail gracefully in a lot of those scenarios. And it's like, well, you may have been meaning to do something here. Um, it would right. just be a very different thing than you were supposing, because a lot of Objective-C is based on the rules for C, uh, which there are some wonky ones. Um, and I guess that takes us into another aspect between these two languages is there are simple aspects for both of them, and then there are complicated aspects for both of them. So it's easy to kind of get started with Swift, um, but if you just dive into some poorly uh, named Swift uh, variables or uh, method names and things like that, it is not necessarily easy to read through, uh, especially if they don't kind of follow the conventions, whereas Objective-C kind of forces you to write sentences uh, yeah. for the most part. and uh, forces you to do it constantly. Um, and thanks to things like autocomplete, it's not really a burden on the programmer to type these out. You just kind of pick the right one. Um, yeah. But uh, it, it's funny that a lot of people say that Swift is a more readable language and it's more expressive uh, when I think just the opposite. And anytime I see Swift code, it's often a lot harder for me to parse mm -hmm. what is going on in there mm -hmm. um, with regard to like what it's trying to do. And then if I look at Objective-C code where everything, all the types are kind of just out there, like mm -hmm. they don't need to be out there. Everything could have been ID, but no one does that. Sure. Um, <laughs> everyone puts their types and everyone has long method names. And that actually leads to fairly readable code if that, like the extra words don't get in your way. Um, yeah. And that is useful uh, when you are reading code that you're not used to um, and it's easier to kind of get into. Now, Objective-C as a whole, there's not much to the language. Most of Objective-C that we think of as a productive programmer is really the libraries that we're using, yeah. whether that's UIKit, Foundation, or AppKit. That's where most of the crux of Objective-C is. Whereas in Swift, we have the Swift standard library, which is part of the language. Like that just comes with uh, the language, whether you kind of want it or not. Right. Um, and if you want more than that, if you want like URLs and stuff, then there is the foundation uh, library and that is separate. Um, but things like arrays and dictionaries, that's all built in. Um, and that's not built into Objective-C. Uh, it kind of can be built in if you consider things like C uh, being part of Objective-C. But most Objective-C developers, you can get quite far without knowing an ounce of C um, or really how pointers work under the hood or any of that. Uh, ben, you were mentioning how uh, you had a C library that you needed to use from Swift. You could totally use that C library directly from Swift, but you're going to need to sprinkle in some extra magic of unsafe mutable pointer uh, a little bit <laughs> <Right>. everywhere. Uh, and <laughs> right. that is hard to use for a reason because you could really mess up the memory yeah. con constraints and 
um, what the programming language is trying to protect you from if mm -hmm. you don't use those methods correctly. That's why they're hard to use uh, to kind of discourage you from using them. But you got around that just by using the C stuff in Objective-C. Yeah. The compiler doesn't know if you're using it correctly or not, but it was easy to write. Right. Uh, right. And then you can use the Objective-C stuff directly from Swift. Right. Uh, so that that is an interesting um, uh, an interesting thing to think about when you are using choosing one language or the other. Uh, right. What what kind of trade offs do you want? Objective C mm -hmm. a lot of loose loose and fast, and you can get a lot done easily. But you can also make some incorrect assumptions along the way if you're not careful, mm -hmm. or you can do it in Swift, and you can force yourself to do it properly from the beginning, uh, which can prevent a lot of bugs. Uh, in the long run. Yeah, definitely. I would say that Objective-C is definitely, I like the verbosity of the language. I thought that was actually really cool when a lot of people don't like that. But when I moved from Java and, and uh, C-sharp to Objective-C, I was like, wow, method names that actually describe what the method does right in yeah. the name. Yeah. How cool yeah. is that? Instead of just, you know, like <laughs> function of some random thing or like, you know, or even, and that extends to things like variable names, you know, yeah. people tended to be Definitely. more verbose there as well. Because like how tiring is it to see, you know, variable X, variable C, variable L. It's like, what are these, th what are these things? Why are you being so stingy, right? It, it, it's one thing if you're coding in nano in, <laughs> In a, you know, in a tech, uh, a text editor inside of a Linux terminal, right? And where you don't counts. have anything, right? Whereas if <laughs> yeah. you're in an Xcode, it's like those things will all be completed for you. So why yeah. not make them exactly. longer and more descriptive? And then, and then, uh, you know, basically let's let's optimize our code for readability rather than writability, right? Because the writability is in some ways. Uh, assisted by this, the syntax highlighting and the code completion and all that kind of stuff inside the IDE. So let's shift our cognitive load away from making it super easily writable because we can get assistance with that, but let's make it more readable um, by once it is written and you look at it later or someone else comes along and looks at it, it makes sense to you in the moment, which I think I, that was such a an interesting kind of light bulb for me when I first started writing Victor C code because I, I started writing it kind of more of the Java way. And then I had to sort of force myself to say, no, no, we, we want to adopt the the practices of the, of the language and be, be sort of a more of a native speaker. And, and it, it was like, wow, this is really cool. And that's something I actually feel like we kind of, we lost a little bit with Swift um, where it's, I do feel like Swift is more approachable, but I don't, there's the whole idea that Swift is easier. I don't personally think Swift is easier than it is to learn. I think it's more approachable. And so mm -hmm. initially it's maybe easier to learn, right? It looks less weird. And so you're like, oh, this is so much easier than to see because there's no brackets and there's no weird stuff, right? But you don't have to get, for anybody who's tried to learn Swift, you don't have to get very far into the language to see all kinds of weird stuff, right? Yeah. Closures yeah. are super generics weird. coming out of left field right. and punching generics, you in the gut. <laughs> uh, yeah, generics didn't really even make sense to me as a developer fully until like last year. And I've been using Swift since it launched in 2014, right? And like they, they never fully clicked with me and they probably still don't. But, but, like, but it's such a weird problem and like pro protocol oriented programming is also something else that's it's not unique to Swift, but it's 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 one that's been very heavily embedded in, into that sort of language, and it's also a very weird thing. Like it it doesn't take very much for you to go, oh, this is what are yeah, which what version are these... of the method is going to be used? Yeah, what are all, all of a sudden these you have weird... no clue? <laughs> what are all these weird things? And then also like type inference, right? Again, more approachable because yeah. I don't have to worry about like, well, you know, the the word Ben in quotes is a string. I don't have to know that sort of strictly speaking because I can type in, you know, let name equal Ben in quotes and it, it just figures it out. Um, so more approachable, but in the long run, when you're looking at code, unless it, for things like that, if it's a string literal, it's pretty obvious, but sure. in other cases, it's not at all obvious. Like what does this method return? And it's going to put Absolutely. it in this variable, right? Whereas when you had a strict uh, explicit typing with Objective C, you always get to see when the variable got declared, what kind of thing it was, because it's literally in the definition. Um, and you can do that when Swift, but, but not only is it, is it not sort of the prevailing style, it's actually kind of like discouraged. If you look in the, if you look in sort of most style guides and even like Apple's guidance and stuff, they're like, don't use explicit typing. If you don't need to let the, let it be, you know, inferent, let it be inferred. Um, and you know, yada, yada, all these benefits, right? Which yes, there are benefits there, but I feel like there's also a downside. Like it makes it less readable necessarily to like a brand new person. And so that's yeah. kind of part of why I say 
that I think Swift is more approachable, but I don't think that ultimately it's actually easier. I think, like you were saying before, Dimitri, the language of Objective-C is actually pretty simple. There's not a whole lot there. And so maybe it looks weird, but it's but once you get over the weirdness of the way that it looks, it's, easy. it's not that hard. Like there's there's just not that mm -hmm. many things you can do with it. I mean, it, 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 there's a ton you can do with it, but like in the sense that there's not a lot of things to learn, right, about how it works. Once you have the basics down and you understand the syntax and the style and the grammar, it, yeah, granted, you can make all done. kinds of mistakes, right? You can, you can, because it's more permissive of things like, you know, messing up your pointers and stuff, that's certainly a problem. I'm not saying it's, I'm not saying it's easier to use, but it's, I do think it's easier to learn uh, on the whole, like compared to Swift. Okay. So, um, well, we're now joined by Fernando. Um, I wanted to talk about something Hello. before uh, we continue here. Um, or as we continue, um, something th that, you know, whether you're on each side of the fence where Ben and Dimitri and Fernando have all learned Objective-C first and are coming to Swift and, and me uh, going kind of the opposite, there is this concept of, you know, the language versus the framework where, um, like Dimitri said, we're very much in the framework. Uh, everything that we do either in Swift or Objective-C uh, is going to be more framework based where because Swift was written to be uh, interoperable with Objective C, you can sort of use them interchangeably. And that's what I'm doing on the daily. Uh, the best part of that is um, once you do get over a lot of, I'm going to say most of the syntax, uh, especially with Swift, because there is there are weird things. Um, you're using the framework, you know, UI kit, foundation, whatever. Um, so for example, if, you know, uh, I don't know if I'm working on some theoretical bug on, on Luma fusion here, um, and say it's an objective C and I think, okay, well, how would I solve this in Swift? Maybe I think, okay, I need to make a protocol and, you know, use the delegate pattern to do this. It's the same thing in objective C or Swift. And that's the good part is, uh, a lot of that knowledge is interchangeable in between languages and you don't necessarily need to relearn how to program an app uh, based on which language you're using, a lot of it is sort of interchangeable. And so that makes my job a lot easier because I, even though as a Swift developer mainly, um, I can jump into LumaFusion head first, um, aside from, you know, the occasional syntax uh, issues like I had uh, earlier this morning, uh, be able to, you know, write code just fine. It might take me a little longer, but I think the um, the threshold is a lot lower than if it was something like going from Swift to you know JavaScript or something. A quick a quick addition to that, I've been using the Stripe um, uh, API as a part of one of the contracting jobs that I'm doing, and they very recently rewrote a lot of it in Swift, but they did it in the worst way possible. As in, it's like a word for word translation um, and it's not really using the features of Swift to their full capacity. In fact, it makes it a lot harder to read as a result. For instance, they have a few if lets to take care of uh, like a, a fair amount of optionals, but they name their if let word different than what the actual like optional is. Uh -oh. So instead of saying like if uh, let card equals card, which is like a, a very common pattern in Swift nowadays, where if card is an optional, that will make card non-optional within the if statement. Uh, they have if let card one equals card. And Ooh. it is very clear mm -hmm. that whoever did that translation, I, I don't know who, uh, but did not necessarily care for improving upon the code legibility. And that's made worse by the fact that there's like no new lines, all the tab spaces are like two spaces. So it's just like a clump of code uh, and it's mm. very, very hard to read. Um, and I, like I, I was previously working with the Objective-C version um, via Swift Package Manager, uh, of all things. Um, but I needed to update it. And all of a sudden, it was all in Swift and all in like the super compressed, uh, almost like minified JavaScript, if you've ever seen that. Uh, and it's like almost impossible to kind of parse by just reading. You have to really pay attention uh, and put your glasses on and get close to the monitor to really make heads or tails of that. And Interesting. it just goes to show you that one language versus another, they can both be legible, they can both be illegible, uh, and it really depends on how you use it and how you use it properly. 
Um, so because you were saying talking about translation, I wanted to put that quick anecdote in because I was just tearing my head, hair out last night uh, regarding just that. <laughs> <laughs> but to, to, to say the other side of the coin, because I think we all love when someone else plays devil's advocate. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was in that position once as the developer translating and the amount of work uh, that you have to put into when moving from Objective-C to Swift and making the Swift code idiomatic and refactored is twice or three times as yeah, much it's not as trivial. if you just translate it straight Agreed. up. And the, tra the translation is going to be horrible because you, you're going to want to refactor and blah, blah, blah. But if you just translate it, someone else uh, like in the team, like what happened was I had a junior developer working with me. I would do the translation because that was the hard part. I knew more Objective-C than, than he did. And then he as a junior would immediately, uh, like every little detail would jump at him, like the, the flat, right? Like, wow, this, this is awful, I need to change this. Whereas if he had done the translation directly and the refactoring, it would have taken us months, uh, either him or me. So that's, that's just another anecdote uh, to, to say that maybe, I, I mean, once you said the if let card won, I was like, okay, maybe this, this is not the case. <laughs> but it was the case for me for a while that I had to just do a rough translation like that. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. As I was converting some of the classes over to Swift, it definitely took me a lot longer than I thought. Like I gave an estimate of, you know, how long would it take me to convert this class of, you know, whatever, a thousand lines or something. And it ended up being, you know, a, a fair amount longer, like easily double because I was doing things like, hey, let's write an enum for this and, you know, yeah. try to make it as swifty as possible. Uh, so I definitely get that perspective as well. And honestly, it's kind of a bummer that, Dimitri, that's not the case for you. That would be a really good, like it ended up, I'm sure, being a really good exercise for the junior, right? Like sort of inadvertently yeah. because it, it helps. It's, it's like, here's a bunch of code that is all sort of technically correct and that it does compile. But it's terrible, right? Like here, like use use all the learning that you've had so far to figure out, you know, uh, like where are all the bad parts, and then and then fix them. Um, I think that that sort of I'm sure that that ended up being a pretty, hopefully a good experience for that person, uh, and that they it was you know, it was a fun experience yeah. for sure. And now that Spencer brings it up, the enums, uh, I love enums. You guys know I love enums. Ben, if you remember my. Uh, Lambda intro, like the uh, the talk was yes, enums, it was literally That's right. that that was the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, I love them. They're the worst when it comes to those translations yeah. because your instinct is, is, is it's exactly like Spencer says, where yes, enums, their power, boom, 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 and then you end up if the if the original code still communicates with with Objective C, you it's a nightmare. Yeah. I ended <laughs> up maintaining two feature. sets of enums. Yeah, exactly. I ended up maintaining like an objective C enum in Swift and then a, a pure Swift enum. And it worked for a while, but then you have two sets of books. Yeah, that's and a, then, yeah. That uh, can be a yeah. Thing. And if you want to move yeah. over to that, you really do need to rewrite the code anyways, whether it was right. originally objective C yes. or Swift, because you're going to use a completely different paradigm to really make it work uh, properly. And that's not something that um, that really works if you're not rewriting it from scratch. Um, there's no amount of Agreed. direct translation that will save you uh, in that case. Um, right. Continuing on the topic that uh, the framework knowledge is kind of separate than the language knowledge, um, that is really doubly so for Objective-C. I mean, a lot of uh, computer science topics to like to talk about these different kind of data structures, an array versus a queue versus a stack versus the new deck that everyone is kind of <laughs> discovering this past week. The, I think it's pronounced DQ. No, DQ is to DQ No, no it's deck. <laughs> um, Fernando is always trolling. It actually <laughs> is a, a DEQ. It's compressed down. I'm <laughs> just kidding. Oh, um, my God. Okay. <laughs> um, but in Objective-C, like an NS array is actually all of these things. It's not strictly defined as a continuous buffer. Nowhere is that promise made. In fact, you're just encouraged to don't care. Just use, if you need something that looks like an array, use an NS array. It will work for you in all sorts of different situations. 
In fact, for the most part, for different sizes, it can be a cyclic buffer, it can be a continuous buffer, it can be several buffers attached, all in the name of performance. You let someone very smart take care of that for you so you don't have to think about it. Um, and that's something that's kind of unique to Apple platforms that is not really there um, elsewhere, uh, where you just have these frameworks provided to you. You just need to know where, like, that they exist so that way you can use them effectively, and then you're kind of good to go. Whereas in Swift, it took a radical departure from that, where an array is just an array. It's just a continuous buffer. Uh, and if you want a static array, then there's a static array. Uh, that's a different thing. Um, if you want a deck, then that's a separate thing as well that's now being provided um, as a separate library that you can then go ahead and use. Uh, and I think that distinction between the language and the framework is actually very interesting to kind of uh, go into because Objective-C is really nothing without the corresponding frameworks, whereas Swift is this pure thing that you can then go ahead and use without any of these frameworks. Um, but they mean two different things um, for the most part. That was very profound. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's interesting, though. I mean, I guess that's why we are able to, uh, you know, have things like server-side Swift and everything, because there is a, a plethora of features built into the language itself where, uh, I mean, maybe you could do it with Objective-C, but I'm sure it would be a fair amount harder just because there is way less built into the language itself. Yeah, you'd have to use new it step or whatever it's called. Yeah, it was amazing. I, st I still think like if my absolute favorite open source project is Robbie Hansen's. I think that's his name. Uh, Coco HTTP server. It's just beautiful. I love it. It's an Objective-C. It's a precursor of uh, Vapor, I would say at least in spirit, and I just love it. Yeah, and the, I don't know why. And the it's corresponding just... async socket, which is a precursor to Neo in a way. Yeah, that's true. And async socket is way more popular than uh, Coco HTTP server, but uh, wrongly so. <laughs> <laughs> Their opinion is wrong. Yes. Um, and that that's... Uh, actually... Go for it. Uh, go, go to me. Oh, um, I want to say that, uh, Spencer, you brought up that Swift is used on the server because it is a much more pure thing. Um, it's interesting you bring that up because early on, uh, well, not even early on, even as er, as recently as Swift 4 and Swift 5, a lot of server applications weren't using the foundation library because it wasn't completely there and it had uh, right. bugs that were associated with it. And we would never assume that foundation has bugs on... Uh, iOS or Mac OS. That's a rock solid thing that we are just expected to m rely on wholeheartedly. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas on the server, it was something that, oh, you're trying to use foundation. Uh, maybe we should rewrite this in a slightly different way. Um, and that's not necessarily true today. Like there has been uh, tons of improvements, uh, both to Swift and to foundation uh, to better cover these things. Um, but that is something that was that was that you needed to keep um, keep in your mind when you were doing that kind of development. Fernando. Uh, well, yeah, uh, it's a little bit of a, of a a change here, but my question to Spencer was, uh, since you like you like you already mentioned, you're you're the only one here that went from Swift to Objective C. Um, would you have like? studied uh would you would you have rather studied a little bit more objective c or is it like no this is good enough for both me and Lu luma studios luma, luma touch luma touch. well yeah, yeah. <laughs> um yeah i i think i definitely could um i i would definitely benefit from more um more study of objective c i think what i know and what i knew going into the job was enough to get me by um and you know i'm able to write objective c code i'm a lot more comfortable with it now um like five months into the job and everything mm -hmm. um but like i said you know the the few seconds of getting hung up on if statements or uh, you know the the syntax of blocks or whatever it is um it's annoying and uh, like today my issue well there are a couple things with it but it was you know i i eventually added a target um 
and a selector and I forgot to put the colon at the end of the method name so the selector didn't work. Like those kind of things are so esoteric that I, I've maybe done that one other time maybe. Uh, so a slight amount of knowledge would be better. But like I said, uh, I'm using foundation or UI kit a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. So uh, I already know how Grand Central Dispatch works. I know how any of this, uh, you know, sort of, again, the framework side of things, it's all there. And so if it takes me a little bit longer to implement it, uh, I can still do it. And it's not like there's this glaring gap in my in my knowledge. But, you know, like Dimitri said, we don't have... Uh, arrays or whatever you have to use ns array so there you know are a slight um there are slight differences where you have to think about everything as a yeah. class and everything but yep i don't know i i would say to anyone that's learning uh definitely spend some time learning objective c as well if you're i would assume you're probably predominantly uh studying swift because mm -hmm. it, if you don't use it in your first job you might use it in your second job or whatever and um yeah, I'll I'll leave it at that. I guess. Well, I think and you just never know where you're going to end up either, right? Like you, you yeah. don't know what companies mm -hmm. you're going to work for, and you don't know what their code bases look like. You don't know how long they've been around. You don't know, you know, whether they've gotten around to swapping over their old legacy code to Swift. Um, so I think even I think it's generally good advice that Swift first is probably a good idea for brand new devs, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. but I but I think don't sleep on Objective C, right? Because it is. You know, it's the old dinosaur language, but it is still, I mean... I don't I, think it's going away anytime yeah, soon. Yeah, it's so big and so... It's been around for so long and it's so entrenched into the to the world of, of iOS dev. I mean, even if we just... If we don't include Mac, we just include iOS dev. For the first half of iOS dev's existence, that was the only option was to see, right? You couldn't even code it mm -hmm. because there was no... It didn't exist. So... Uh, there's a lot of code that's already been written and there's no good reason to change it um, pot potentially, mm -hmm. right? I mean, yes, yeah, you can be translate and get, get a rough translation, but that's not going to be useful. It's just going to make harder yeah. to recode. Right. So, so why, in some cases, why change it, right? Why swap yeah, it out for, for Swift? Sure. You're just going to, you know, I mean, that's sort of that, the old Joel Spolsky article from back in like 2000, I think, where he basically says, you know, you should, essentially, you should never re, re, initiate a oh, rewrite yep. of your code base, right? Oh, yeah. I don't know if that's totally true in every single every single case, but but certainly it's the case that there's no reason to switch it over for no good reason other than like, well, we want it to all be in Swift. Like, well, that's not good. That's not a good enough reason, right? Because you're going to trade <laughs> uh, bugs that exist in the Gypsy code for, for, all new bugs that are might be worse in the Swift code base, right? So you, it's there's there's no magic uh, formula there for getting it converted, and having it be sort of fundamentally better. Um, yep. And so you're gonna like in your case, right? You you join LumaTouch, and it turns out they have a whole bunch of Mitchell C code. So yeah, uh, and and I wouldn't have pegged them as necessarily super heavy on the old language, since in in my from my naive view. I don't. I didn't even think they were that. Even they've been around that long that that was mm -hmm. that would be a concern. But turns out, totally is right. And and in places that I've worked in the past, I I used to work where Fernando now works, and there was a whole bunch of density code in, in that in that code base. And again, I wouldn't have necessarily pegged it as a place that relied on it, but turns out it, they did. And so and having that knowledge is is uh, is definitely a useful feather in your cap. So so new yeah. brand new devs don't just because you. It, <laughs> feels old and moldy right don't, don't 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 sleep on it don't sleep on it right don't ignore it it's it's really useful. yeah well and like now uh -huh, go sorry go. um i i remember as i was learning swift it, when i was it, sort of in in uh, the boot camp i was in andrew madsen was was teaching there and something stuck out to me which you know being new i didn't really understand but he said some things are easier to write in objective c and what he's done and is now doing is a lot of audio engineering and a lot of, uh, you know, uh, low level stuff where like digging into pointers is probably way, way easier and much less, um, you know, uh, well, yeah. There's no hand fraught with problems, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Like you, you might not sanity. do it correctly, but if you know what you're doing, it's going to be a lot cleaner and a lot easier to read. Whereas in Swift, exactly. it's going to force you to do it the right way, but that's not going to make nice looking code. And it's going right. to be fraught with danger signs everywhere, uh, yeah. Yeah. which 
in a way, it's a good thing. It tells other developers, hey, you probably don't want to be messing with this um, <laughs> yeah. and make, make a silly error because ultimately every security exploit comes down to someone not using pointers correctly. Like it's that yeah. simple of a bug uh, and you just have to probably write it fine the first time, make a change, and that's when you forget to kind of keep track of things and that's it. Like that, you, lo you lost at that point. Um, exactly. Which, Going going back to the translation thing, you lose Git history if you translate something. You're no longer yeah. going to be able to tell where individual lines of code came from because it's a completely different file. Git has no clue like where things came from. You're just throwing all that away. Uh, so unless you have a good reason mm -hmm. to do it, it's it's kind of fraught. Yeah. So I have a question for the group. I have the sudden urge of finding a mentee and teaching them in pure objective c with mrc on Ooh. how how bad would that be <laughs> like how much <laughs> <laughs> so forget swift is a dead how language how much do i not want to do like that <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> so uh, my, uh, to be concrete wait wait to be concrete how much like how how can i say this would they take longer or would it be faster for them to get to a decent level? Like let's say six to eight months of Objective-C, pure Objective-C, blah, blah, and then six to eight months of Swift. So we're at like a year and a half versus um, a year and a half pure Swift. So before mm. anyone answers that, um, going back to Spencer's question that he was asking us in our Rubber Ducky, Rubber Ducky uh, channel. Um, yeah. By the way, you should check out our community on Quill uh, code completion dot io yes. slash join the club uh, and you can ask similar questions i post interesting links in there all the time that you can find uh, but ba going back to uh, the question that spencer was asking um it actually related to an interesting behavior of old non-arc code so basically if you pass a reference to your class yeah it, you just assume in whether it's an objective c or in swift we would have hit the same bug uh, yeah. that, that class would have been either uh, maintained and a reference would have been maintained or it would have been weekly released if the class went away, but that wasn't the case uh, because the frameworks that Apple writes, they are not written with Arc. They are written with the old style of manual reference counting and they had to be up until very recently because they had to maintain the 32-bit Objective-C runtime um, and now that's different, so they're probably modernizing as much as they can because there are interesting bugs that come about uh, when you assume something is ARC compatible and it might not be. Uh, so going directly into Fernando's question, I think it could be tremendously useful rather than learning Objective-C proper to really understand what the concepts that the frameworks are kind of built on um, and know what those what those individual things are, um, whether you're doing Swift development or Objective-C development, I think knowing that uh, is a tremendous leg up compared to many other developers that probably started with just Swift. Um, like, but knowing that is different than, than actually practicing. Oh yeah, right? definitely. Cause, Cause it doesn't matter how much, how many times I explain MRC or ARC to someone they're going to be like, yeah, yeah, whatever. I just type let here. No, totally. And the, That's exactly right? what happened to me today. I mean, I know how reference counting works. I just didn't make an object outside of a method to store the reference. And, you know, it led to that. And that You was... didn't get bitten by that bug time and time and time and time again. But I don't know exactly. if six months yeah. is enough for that. Yeah. That, that takes yeah. a decade of, of <laughs> I mean, getting... it's been years, well, yeah. <laughs> I, no, I would say it is enough. The the first time you over release something or under release it, you're gonna feel the pain, and it's gonna happen very quickly unless you have like a really. But you're quick not gonna sense know like, that's the problem man. the first time you run into it. Yeah, I that's felt no, no, not the first time, <laughs> but but it's something like for instance, um, I, it's something that I keep in mind always, and and I think at, I, you may correct me, Spencer, but it's something that up until today it was like, oh yeah, I know this. But it's not something that's constantly like on every property yeah. that you declare. Um, yeah, definitely. Where is this being maintained? And that's something that I have because I learned uh, what in the MRC times. Yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, for, no, for sure. Right? So, for example, when I was first teaching iOS, we didn't use Swift because we were it was 2015, so Swift was like 1.0. It didn't feel nearly ready enough for me to teach it seriously. So we used Objective-C, um, and at one point I had a student working on their homework, and I went over to help them, and they were having this weird bug, and we literally spent 20 minutes, 30 minutes trying to solve this problem. It turns out they had accidentally imported a... Um, a dot m file rather than a dot h oh, file yeah. <laughs> and then xcode did not like that at all and like was just freaked out and it, and i and yeah. because i had never done that because i had learned obviously that's not how you do it right i had never come across that bug before in my development um and so i didn't i initially didn't know how to fix the problem because i was like what is wrong with your code like it's just so unhappy <laughs> and we dug around and dug around and eventually it's like oh you're importing an m file you don't want to do that import the header file and you're good and as soon as we fix that it was done and then what was nice was like after that when that that happened i think maybe like mm -hmm. one or two, two other times i was like oh yeah here you go it's you're importing yeah. an m file right? and it's, it's not it, technically a bug right no no <laughs> i agree no but i'm saying like it's it's, but, it's definitely behavior but. that is that, that was very strange right and yeah. and and then i had not seen so it's an example of like the, basically what I'm saying is the experience, right? There is no substitute yes. for the experience. I didn't for have sure. the experience as the teacher, and so I was not that helpful the first time. But then the second, third, fourth time, if it happens yeah. again, where it's like, oh, I know what's wrong. I, I know how to fix that problem. And so like right. to your point, Fernando, I think I think having that experience, there there is no substitute for having that experience. So if it's a year and a half of Swift, and then they suddenly have to go work somewhere where they have to jump into Victor C, they're, they're definitely not going to be as well off as if they had six to eight months of a bit to see first, especially if it was like, you know, you gave, you took away all the toys and it's like, you got to use MRC. You can't, you know, you, you have to, you have to be sort of very pure to the language. You're, you're going to run into all kinds of problems oh, and you're going to fix yeah. them and it's going to burn it into your brain that, you know, yeah. this is how you use reference counting and this is how you do that and this and that. And, and it's just not, it's just not going to happen right that way if you, if you don't if you don't have that seat time, right? That we, I think we said this last time, yeah. you get, there's no substitute for seat time. Yeah. But as, as you said- Do any of you know if you can enable, uh, sorry, Demi, do, do you know if, if anyone, like if you can enable MRC in, a, in an existing project? Yeah, you can yeah, disable. Totally. Oh, and you well, can you can it, disable ARC, right? I don't yeah, know, you can, you'd you can have disable to just ARC, disable ARC. Or you can leave it's ARC just on and you can settings. disable it on individual files. So yeah. dash F, That's no, brilliant. dash object yes. to C, dash ARC, I think it is. Yeah. Nice. Don't ask me why I memorize I'm going to do something like that. <laughs> it's going to be really fun. I, I'm very, I'm very <laughs> worried for your future mentee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Stay away from Fernando. Yeah. But as Ben That's said, you can totally learn this on the job. Like if yeah. you have spent yeah. all your yeah. time just learning Swift yeah. and then a new job trusts you enough to kind of tackle some of their older Objective-C code base, you're going to learn it on the job. It's not, totally. it's not something totally. that you totally need to be 100% on because even if you knew Objective-C, you may not have known about uh, manual reference counting uh, that came before it and you would still hit the same bugs. And even if yeah. you didn't know about yep. manual reference counting, you might not know about uh, memory pages and like C allocation and you would have hit the same bugs. And it goes all the way down. Like you can, you can know everything and that will make you a better programmer perhaps or you can know the more modern stuff only uh, and be really comfortable with that. Um, and every now and then, you will kind of hit those same snags um, that others have hit many times before you, but there's a lot of help that already exists um, out in the world and out on Google that you can definitely go ahead and reference. Yeah, agreed. So this week's episode is brought to you by Underdog Devs and their Sprint into Swift event. Underdog Devs is a community for the formerly incarcerated to get the resources they need to enter into software development through sharing resources, mentorship, and building an open community on their Slack that anyone can join. Throughout the month of April, Underdog Devs will be hosting talks from around the iOS community to spread both awareness and knowledge. In fact, all of us will also be hosting talks ranging from programming patterns to server-side development um, I already did mine. It was on Git and app development. Um, and like uh, all the other talks, they will all go onto uh, their YouTube channel. So if you can't make it, you can definitely go and find them there. Uh, be sure to give uh, them a follow on Twitter at Underdog Devs to know when each event goes live uh, and to grab a free ticket on Eventbrite. 
uh, which we'll link to below in the show notes to see the full calendar. Uh, so Ben, what talk will you be giving? So I actually have two talks. One is a sort of a topic where I'm teaching. It's an introduction to the Swift Composable Architecture, which is kind of a newer idea around how to organize your code and how to sort of make it interoperate uh, in the world of Swift UI and Combine. Um, and then the other one I'm giving is more informal. We're going to just do a resume and portfolio review. So this is a thing that I've seen Sean Allen do a whole bunch, and it looks like it's fun. So uh, hopefully we'll get some people on the call that can share their resume, and then we can just talk about kind of best practices around how to use uh you know the space that you have effectively and, and get your point across and really market yourself well so that you can ensure that you get a callback spencer yeah um i'll be doing a talk on uh, building a rest api with vapor uh so you know host it on heroku or whatever and you can use that as your rest uh, api backend um so you can kind of do more of a you know full stack thing without having to write a backend in you know javascript or whatever and or use something like firebase um so i'm super stoked uh i love vapor as as you may or may not know uh it's very basic but it would get you your foot into the door of vapor kind of understanding that world of using you know like we were talking about no foundation or anything but just these these frameworks and uh, it it'll be a fun time so i'm super stoked awesome and fernando i'll be uh, i've been hosting the amas so you can you can catch me in any of the uh the the other AMA, amas ask me anything talks and i have my own uh my own talk called newcomers bash where i do what i do best which is troll people <laughs> and by that, no, I'm kidding. I, I'm going to interview junior devs, ask them about their journey, how they got there, uh, sharing their experiences, which I think is really useful if you want to get into uh, mobile development. Nice. So all talks are completely free to attend. Uh, so you should definitely head over to that Eventbrite link, uh, follow Underdog Devs on Twitter, and we want to thank them and the Spring, Spring into Swift event uh, for sponsoring Code Completion. So now that we've gone through our topics, it's time for Complete the Code, where we quiz our listeners on your knowledge of Swift, Apple, and all things development. Um, so we have a question from two weeks ago that we asked. Ben, do you want to take it away? A couple of weeks ago, we had uh, a question, which was, we're calling Malik on an argument of eight and saving the result in a pointer called qu uh, my qu quote object unquote. What built-in way that doesn't require the use of an internet connection can you use to get the documentation on many C functions like malloc? And we do have a winner. Craig Swanson uh, correctly guessed on Twitter by tweeting at us. Um, he said, how about using terminal and using the command man, man malloc? So man is the, the manual command that allows you to look up all kinds of documentation on things. And so in this case, we can look up malloc and see what it does. For this week, we have a, uh, a different one. Um, and actually, this one was suggested to us by listener David Wright. He says, uh, we have a class called delay task with two properties, complete set to false and an optional dis dispatch work item called task. Finally, a method called configure sets task to a new dispatch work item. And then the completion block is a dispatch async after to the main queue with a weak capture of self so it can set, com so it can set complete to true after five seconds. So somewhere in this code block, which you can see if you're listening to the podcast as the chapter art um, or in the show notes, uh, or if you're watching the video, you can see it on screen. Um, somewhere in this code block, there is a memory leak. So we need you to help us find the memory leak and fix it. Thank you, Ben. Uh, so with all that away, it's time for Compiler Error, a segment where I get to test my fellow completionist knowledge about Swift, Apple, and all things development. And since we talked a whole bunch about Objective-C, I figured Objective-C is an apt uh, topic oh, no. for this week. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. I'm thinking this we're one all... wrong. <laughs> we're all losing. So we have our statements uh, this week, as we do every week, uh, and let's go through them. So much like Swift, Arc can be configured to operate on core foundation types in Objective C code using the option dash f dash Objective C dash Arc dash CF types at compile time. Statement number two: Automatic reference counting was originally called automatic retain release abbreviated as ARR, and was ultimately changed to ARC before release. Statement number three, unlike with ARC, Objective-C garbage collection required users to implement finalize rather than dialloc for object cleanup. And statement number four, although they were introduced, 
uh, with arc. At auto release pool, blocks can also be used in code where arc is disabled since it offers a performance improvement. Uh, so uh, let's go ahead and start with you, Fernando, since you're the master of Objective C. You should there we go. Uh, there we go. I like this. Ah, uh, no, this is the worst case scenario. Um, these are really interesting. Uh, number three, I can believe. Uh, I've never, I've never enabled the garbage collection, but I, I would assume it's different. Uh, cause you, you're probably not getting called to the alloc. Uh, number two sounds like a joke because it's R. I don't know what R. to think. R. Uh, number four, you got me real good there. It's been so long since I don't have to auto release anything, especially in Objective C, that I it's don't a swift remember. Too. What? <laughs> it's a swift feature too. Uh, no, no, no. Of course, of course. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that. Uh, I'm pretty sure there were no auto release blocks in Objective C. So it's. Oh, okay, that's perfect. So yeah, number four is definitely a no go. Uh, so that's uh, that's the compiler or. Yes, actually. Yeah, that's the compiler. Okie dokie. Anticlimactic, uh, but yes. <laughs> ben? All right, so uh, I agree with Fernando that number three, I never used garbage collection, but that does seem reasonable that there'd be a different uh, implementation for cleaning it up rather than using dialog. Um, uh, R sounds interesting. Uh, it, it does sound kind of like a joke, but at the same time, you know, retain release is kind of what, what we called, you know, what you, what you call when you manage memory in Objective C. So I feel like automatic retain release does sound, it actually sounds like something a developer of that feature would have called it. And then they were like, <laughs> eh, we don't like R as, a, as an yeah, abbreviation. Exactly. Let's change it to something else. And then someone else sort of maybe more with a marketing spin perhaps thought of automatic reference counting as a, as a better descriptor and also as a better, um, a better uh, acronym. So, uh, that does it does sound like that could be that that's probably true um number one r can be configured to operate on core foundation types in objective c code using the option uh, f objective c arc cf types at compile time seems reasonable uh so number four this is where fernando says was the compiler error I'll, so i want to read this very carefully to make sure that that, that dimitri is not doing anything weird here <laughs> Which we always accuse him of, and he very rarely does, but still. <laughs> That's <laughs> true. I'm wrong a lot, so like I, I want to have some excuse, some reason why. I'm like, oh, I need to sprinkle those in from now on, so that way you yeah, can Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Although they were introduced in, with ARC, at auto-release pool blocks can also be used in code where ARC is disabled since it offers a performance improvement. I feel like I've seen those. So, so there's no discussion, is there? Like, this is Ben alone? Uh... What, yeah, what are the rules, Dimitri? Can, are we allowed to talk to each other, or is it just no, me talking out loud? No, just Ben. Okay. Ah. Ooh, no phone a friend. No phone a friend. No. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, but I feel like I've seen them, and that could very possibly be wrong. I could be, totally be confused here. But then, like, if that's right, then which one of these is the wrong one? I'm... <laughs> I'm just going to, I'm usually, I, I don't get this right very much. So I'm just going to be contrarian and say that it's, I don't agree with Fernando. <laughs> I'm going to say number one uh, is the compiler error. Okay. And I'm probably answer. wrong, but hey, it's a game. Um, there are, there okay. are very it's low a learning here, experience. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's true. Um, yeah. I'm going to say two and three are also true. Um, I almost feel like Andrew Madsen once said automatic retain release when he was, he, yeah, I don't know. I'm going to say that that's fine. And uh, I also have not ever used garbage collection. I barely use manual reference counting, so I have no idea. Um, yeah, okay. So uh, the, my thing with number four is, like, uh, I guess you could maybe abuse an auto release pool so it doesn't have a performance improvement. It could, like, degrade performance, maybe, I guess. Um, but I also, Dimitri, when you were talking earlier, and maybe I just misunderstood, but it sounded like when we were talking about Objective-C and reference counting, um, you said something like 
you know, a foundation wasn't written, those objects in foundation weren't written to use arc. They, they use manual reference counting because of 32 bit support. So I'm going to say number one is actually the, the compiler error. I'll, I'll go with Ben. On this will be one. very interesting to see. I know we're, we're probably all Dimitri wrong. We may have given two. it away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So let's go in reverse order because that's always fun. Uh, so starting with number four, although they were introduced with ARC, <laughs> add or release full can also be used in a code where ARC is disabled since it offers a performance improvement. Uh, so Fernando, you think this one's the compiler error. Um, and uh, let's go through this piece by piece. So uh, yes. when ARC came out, uh, at uh -huh. auto release pool was the new way of using auto release pools since the compiler would insert your retains and releases for you. Uh, and mm. this also went for any auto release messages that you sent. Um, so they said, okay, uh, we're also going to make an at auto release pool block that takes a curly brace. You can I put some code it. in there and then end the curly brace. And that would take care of you essentially writing NS mm -hmm. auto release pool, enter and drain, I think. I forget what yep. the exact uh, flush, methods were. Yeah, flush. Um, uh, I forget what the one to enter the pool was. Uh, but in any case, uh, that was available with ARC. So when you have ARC disabled, the question is now, is at auto release pool something that you can use or is it something that you should just use NS auto release pool? And it turns out that at auto release pool works whether ARC is on or off. So I'm sorry, Fernando. Uh, this one is a code completion. Um, and Ac that makes Apple sense. in their documentation actually suggests, please do use at auto release pool because it's more performant uh, from the compiler's point of view, because it will insert, um, it will know to kind of keep track of at auto, at, um, sorry, auto release pull messages within that block and take care of those for you instead of pushing them onto uh, some construct that's just part of the thread, which is what an auto release pool is. Uh, so I, I'm sorry. Yeah, I got, I got distracted by the fact that it was a blog and I was like, that must be, I, I can vividly remember the auto release pool blog in Swift, right? It's available in mm -hmm. Swift. Yeah. yeah. But but I remember doing the manual, either retain release or going into a, an auto release pool. So I couldn't remember this block as part of Objective C. That makes sense. Well, th those are Apple's words, uh, but it's more of a statement in Objective C. Um, but I guess that's what a block is. Um, but in any case. Uh, moving on to number three. So unlike with ARC, Objective-C garbage collection required users to implement finalize rather than dialloc. Um, what none of you picked up on is that in the in the, in the the history of Objective-C, we started with dialloc, and then you had to kind of use finalize with garbage collection. And then do we kind of go back to dialloc with ARC? Um, no, no one kind of found that to be... Uh, a little weird, uh, and that's because it isn't weird because that's completely true. That's that's how it works. Oh um, so the only difference with arc and no arc is that dialloc with arc you cannot call super dialocate. Um, mm -hmm. The the compiler will uh, automatically call dialloc on any super classes that implement dialloc, um, and it will skip over the ones that don't, uh, which is in general uh, more performant. Um, and that's why it kind of takes care of that for you. And that's why you shouldn't call super so that way you don't spend time kind of jumping up um, the super classes like that. Uh, so statement number two, automatic reference counting was originally called automatic retain release, abbreviated as R, R and uh, was ultimately changed to ARC before release. Uh, so I first learned about this during WWDC when ARC was announced. Um, I was a little youngin walking the halls of Moscone Center uh, and uh, I was talking with one of uh, the the Apple developers, and they were asking me, "Hey, what what are you most excited about?" And I'm like, definitely Arc. That seems like it's something really cool. And he he told me that uh, well, we originally named it R, like the pirate saying R, but the managers didn't like that, so they they forced us to change it. Now, <laughs> I, being a good internet uh, netizen, did not want to just blindly trust this before I throw it in a uh, code completion. Um, so I went and and looked it up, and it turns out that if you f go to opensource.apple.com and you look up uh, the Objective C source code, you'll see that there are tons of little macros like arr underscore logging um, that are just kind of sprinkled in there 
Um, and anything related to ARC all uses ARR for automatic retain release. Uh, so that one is also a, uh, a code completion. So that takes us to the final one, number one. And congratulations to both Ben and Spencer. This is the compiler error. Uh, much finally. like Swift, ARC we got can be one configured <laughs> I know. Right, on core foundation types. So core foundation is different than foundation. Uh, this is CF dictionary, mm -hmm. CF array, um, and mm. in uh, and it extends to things like core graphics as well. Um, so, for instance, in Swift, you don't need to use uh, CF retain or CF release when you're using core graphics. Mm -hmm. It's just taken care of for you. However, if you use core text, out of luck, you have to kind of use um, uh, use the retain and releases with the core text types. Um, but with core graphics, you don't. Now, the question is, did that also work for Objective-C? And it turns out it never did. Uh, in Objective-C, you always have to call CF retain, CF release when you're using any sort of core foundation type um, and any subtype, uh, if you can call them that, uh, from the various different frameworks. Uh, and there's no such uh, cheat of using uh, a compiler time um, setting to kind of enable that uh, so that way you don't have to take care of it anymore. So even though ARC is a thing of the future um, or a thing, a thing of the present and manual reference counting is a thing of the past, you still need to do manual reference counting, whether it's in Objective-C or in Swift uh, when you're using certain types. So back to your statement, Fernando, maybe you don't even need Objective-C to teach manual reference to core text.